Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us to uh, here in the basement of the Congress Centre here in Davos for the third issue brief of the day. We've just finished up on currency shocks, and we're having a bit of a change of a change of pace, a change of subject. We're now on the subject of neuro research. I'm honoured to be joined by uh, two very eminent scientists who have just been upstairs uh, on, a, on a specially dedicated session in one of our ideas lab. Um, rooms on the subject of the brain and the research that's going on around it. I have uh, to my immediate left here Anne Brunette, who's a professor of genetics at Stanford School of Medicine, Stanford University, and Marion Bookwalter um, on the far left, assistant professor of neurology and neurosurgery, uh, again at Stanford University Medical Center. Now, that seems like a fitting place to start this conversation. I understand there are four um, people from Stanford in the Ideas Lab you've just, uh, you've just come from. Uh, what is it about Stanford uh, that, that's setting you out as the leading center for brain research? Well, I think one of the things is that we have world-class basic science, but there's several places that also have world-class basic science. One of the things that we have that really distinguishes us is we have really a fantastic environment of innovation. So we're right in the middle of Silicon Valley. We have a, a university that's incredibly strong in multiple areas and that really fosters not just innovation but collaboration. So we get the opportunity to work with people from many different fields on the questions that we think are the most important. Anne, you're an expert on aging, so the obvious question is, can we reverse aging? It's a, it's a question many people, not just here in the Congress Center, but all over the world, would, would be keen to, uh, keen to learn. Yes, so um, basically until like recently, aging was thought to be just an inexorable one-way road um, towards death, basically. But this view has changed because um, now there are some indications that um, genetic and environmental factors can, in fact, at, at the very least delay, but now even more excitingly, revert some aspects of aging, meaning like an already old organism uh, with some treatment can, to some degree, come back to a more youthful uh, way. So there are several ways in which doing that. One of the most prominent one that uh, our colleague Tony Wiscore discussed at the Ideas Lab was to inject young blood to an old uh, organism, and that makes it rejuvenate in, in uh, the brain, but also the muscle and other aspects of the body. There are also uh, other uh, research that has come from the study of the genetic of aging, which is uh, some of the thing we do. Uh, so, for example, a, path, uh, a genetic pathway uh, can be manipulated by a drug called, uh, it's called rapamycin, and this extends lifespan. So that's already very interesting in and of itself. But when rapamycin is given to an old animal, it can revert some aspects again of uh, uh, and make of the old animal and make it more functional. So, indeed, like uh, there is hope for the first time that uh, some aspects of aging can be uh, at least to some degree reversed. So that's uh, cool. And, and what kind of aspects are we talking about? Are we talking, you know, mental capability or f physical prowess? Uh, both actually, because uh, so Tony upstairs discussed a mental capability like learning and memory by tests that are done in mice. Uh, but uh, you can also, and we work on neural stem cells, and you can see also that some of those treatments have an impact on the ability of the brain to uh, rejuvenate some, to regenerate some new neurons. Uh, but that's not limited to just the brain, because other groups at Harvard, for example, Amy Wages has shown that um, uh, other, uh, so, so some aspects of the heart, some aspects of the muscle, Tom Randall at Stanford as well, so some aspect of the muscles, other tissues are also uh, rejuvenated. Not all, probably, but a lot of tissues can be rejuvenated by uh, those uh, treatments. Uh, what are the practical applications uh, you know, at this stage? We're obviously too early, but when, when can we expect to see, to see this, being, uh, this, this science being applied on humans, and, and what would be the impact? Are we looking at living forever, living for another 10 years? Can you give us an idea of, of what your realistic expectations are for the, limit, you know, for, for the limits of this, of the, of this knowledge and, and, and yeah. this ability you, you, that you're on the cusp of discovering? So, so basically, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting because right now, this, this past two years has been a boom in uh, industry actually being interested in aging research because for the uh, for longest time, it was more like a basic science research. But Google has started a company called Calico uh, and it's, it's really amazing what, what they've decided to do is to fund 
basically a translation uh, of the basic science to um, to humans and uh, to extend um, what we call the health span, which is the healthy, po the non-diseased portion of life. And then Craig Venter has also started his own company called Longevity Inc. And I think a lot of people then are following the lead and uh, of, of uh, Google, uh, Calico, and, and Craig Venter into like, um, a lot of venture capitalists are, are now interested because it really seems at this point that there is a lot of handles, drugs or like blood, like our colleague Tony who started his own company actually. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of different handles that can be used. So it's, it's really a good time. Now, whether this uh, societally, I think the goal is really to try and extend the, the to compress the morbidity, to extend the healthy portion of life where people are don't have disease, so it's not it's less of a burden on society. Now, it, uh, it is true that all those treatments, at least in animals, they also tend to extend the lifespan of the animal. Um, so uh, one has to think about like what would extending the lifespan of, of humans um, could do. So there, there's probably like a genetic limit to the extension of lifespan around like probably 110 or 20. Uh, years, genetically speaking, but you know what will it mean if we have a lot of people like being a hundred years old? But if they're in good health, um, the UK actually has uh, done a, a big study to sort of like uh, well, uh, um, so basically people have done big studies to try to see the implication of having more old people around. But if those people are healthy, they can actually amazingly contribute to society because of wisdom, like. Um, uh, acquired experiences and things like that. So I'm pretty hopeful, but I can see how it can be a problem as it's well. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's an optimistic picture, yeah. as somebody <laughs> in uh, advancing middle age can, can confirm. <laughs> now, Marion, uh, moving on to your, your field of expertise, which is, which is stroke recovery, if I'm not mistaken. What, what's making that such an exciting area of science right now? Well, one of the most exciting things is that we have the availability of new tools to really begin to understand how the brain recovers. And it's, it's, it's funny how it's all tied together, too. So, like, we're talking about making things young again. One of the things we take advantage of is that younger people actually recover a lot better from a stroke than older people. And so part of rejuvenation is probably also being able to heal better and make new circuits better. So the idea is if you have a stroke and you injure a part of your brain, like let's say you injured the part that moves, say, your right hand, then those cells actually die, but the brain can make new circuits around them. And now we can see those circuits with some of our newer technologies and actually measure how they reform and how long it takes them to reform and which therapies help them do so better more effectively. And, and, and again, I guess a, a, simi a similar question, this is very exciting research, but when uh, yeah, can you offer us some kind of timeline as to, or, or, or end goal from here? Are you looking for 100% mm -hmm. recovery from stroke or, or, or what is your realistic ambition for the, for the, for the science? Well, I think uh, as a doctor and a scientist, I want to cure everybody. Mm -hmm. and, but we realize these are really difficult questions. And part of what makes it science is its unpredictable nature. We don't know the answer. If we knew the answer, then we could tell you, oh, it's going to take a year or it's going to take 10 years. Um, so that's one part to your question. Now, we do have therapies we're hopeful about that we hope to be testing in the next few years. So maybe within the next five or 10 years, we'll have a therapy. Your other question was sort of do we want to get it, get everybody back completely, or would it help to to help people a little bit? And the answer is really every little bit helps. So one of the major things about stroke is it's the leading cause of disability in the developed world. And if you think about what it means to be disabled, say if you take something like walking, um, if you can't walk fast enough to cross the street before the light changes, then you're really limited in what you can do. And if I could increase your walking speed so you can cross the street, then it's fine. You can shuffle slowly the rest of the time. Or if you can't walk quickly enough to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. that really disables you. So if, I, if you can get fast enough that you can make it to the bathroom, that I think a lot of patients would be very, very happy with that, even though they would love to be able to run again or do a marathon, at least. Absolutely. So a little bit would go a long way. Incremental benefits. Indeed. Now, we hear a lot about the, the vast um, 
uh, you know, ability of computing power and big data to, to transform the research you're doing. So I'm interested to know what, what are the what are the breakthrough um, technologies that are helping make this such an exciting area of research. And I guess also what are the challenges too? What's what's preventing you from from accelerating your your research faster and, and developing the science at a, at a faster clip? So challenges yeah. first, but also that maybe maybe let's first start with you know what are the game changers? How is how is the game changing? Well, so definitely, if we talk about um, um, the science of aging and longevity, it's important to consider that aging is really a system. That the aging body is a system, and in fact, um, as I was uh, discussing up there in the ideal lab, uh, Stanford is, is awesome, as Marian also pointed out, because it's part of the Silicon Valley, so it has like all this access to technology, and one uh, technology that's really revolutionizing um, the, uh, the the genetic genetic is like the as you say, big data and ultra high throughput type of approach to the genome, the epigenome, the proteome, the metabolome. And all these are very important because for the first time, we have the ability to probe in an unbiased manner rather than a biased uh, specific manner. We have the ability to probe unbiasedly the changes that occur uh, with aging, whether it's mutation, whether it's um, ch uh, just like changes in, in how like the protein fold and etc. So it's really, really powerful and I think it's going to teach us a lot about an aging system. So for us that's been a revolution and it's been great being at the epicenter of it at, at Stanford. Mm. Sure. Mar anything to add, Mariam? Obviously, the putting putting everybody together in, in as you are at Stanford is, is producing um, economies of scale, if you will, in terms of the the, the brain power of the, of the scientists. But what's what's changing, or maybe what what are the big challenges facing? Uh, you know, further further breakthroughs, or you know, the uh, the accelerating the, the work you're doing. Well, like I was saying, one of our biggest challenges is really understanding how people recover from stroke, and so how we need to understand it before we can develop treatments to promote it. And the big data approaches that you're asking about really help with that. So we are just starting to recruit um, subjects, so people who've had a stroke who want to help us understand how recovery happens. And we're going to be gathering data from all kinds of devices, standard clinical measures, but also new devices made by our engineers that are part of our stroke research group to do things. For example, t they're making Bluetooth-enabled devices so we can gather data in real time from people who are just moving around wherever they're at. And so having the big data approaches to take all that data and put it together and say, well, what's really important? Like take walking speed. If I'm measuring their walking speed, how do the other factors relate? That takes a lot of computing power. It's a pretty complicated question. <laughs> it is a complicated question for a, for a, for a complicated uh, subject. But thank you very much, both of you, for, for helping enlightening us and uh, I'm, I wish you a successful annual meeting and, and, and look forward to hearing and reading more about your research in the days, months, years to come. Thank you. And thank you very much to our audience watching us online at weforum.org.